Good morning, everyone, and happy Juneteenth. It's wonderful to see so many of you gathered here with us in a safe way. Uh, we are grateful to those who have come out today. And uh, I wanted to start, my name is Keisha Rahm, and I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, this is the land of the Abenaki people that we stand on. Uh, they cultivated, stewarded, and lived on this land long before other Vermonters that are here with us today. We honor them and uh, we acknowledge that this is still their land and they are still remaining with us, they are not invisible. I also want to acknowledge that there are many black folks who helped to cultivate this land, who put the, their, their hands in the dirt in Vermont and have made this state what it is. Uh, I want to acknowledge first thinking about down the road the, the Rokeby House and the idea that this was one of the last stops on the Underground Railroad. And I often tell young people, you know, when you look at uh, that stop on the Underground Railroad, it was a Quaker farm. And the Quakers, while they may have had the money from the merino wool that they were producing, uh, they did not believe that you could buy another person. So they did not believe that they could give the money uh, to a, um, a fugitive slave to buy their freedom because it was against their entire belief system. But they could have those folks work on their farm earn enough money to buy their own freedom. And I say that story because it reminds me that there's a long history in Vermont of acknowledging that black lives matter just as much as other lives, that you can't own a life, that you can't pay for a life, and you can't take a life in that way because of the color of someone's skin. And that's something that we need to remember as we acknowledge that we've painted Black Lives Matter uh, on the, um, in front of the state capitol, that that's the beginning of our work. I also want to acknowledge Harold Holloway, uh, many people know the Holloway block in Burlington, but they don't know that Harold Holloway was a Buffalo soldier who was married to an Abenaki woman. And unfortunately, she couldn't have children, and it's believed by the Abenaki people that she had been forced sterilized in the eugenics movement. Um, but Harold Holloway, and still we have the Holloway block, which is some of the most beautiful buildings in town, had a bait and tackle shop and helped make Burlington what it is. And I, uh, finally, I want to acknowledge Richard Kemp. Uh, the first black man to be on the city council in Burlington. We would not have some of the affordable housing and the spaces for people in the community um, that we have without someone like Richard Kemp. So we stand on the shoulders of giants, um, black Vermonters who have made our state what it is, and we honor them today. With that, I want to just take a moment to acknowledge the elected uh, officials and candidates who are here and then turn it over to my co-host, Joy Dixon, who I'm grateful to have with me. And I'm gonna pan here. Um, I don't have the full list, but just wave to me if I miss you. Um, we have Brenda Siegel, a candidate for Lieutenant Governor. We have Senator Debbie Ingram, another candidate for Lieutenant Governor. Representative Maida Townsend from South Burlington. Are you an elected official? No, that's a Church Street passerby. Um, Representative John Kalaki from South Burlington, Attorney General T.J. Donovan, um, I don't, City Councilor Brian Pine. I don't see. Oh, that's uh, Senate Senate President Pro Tem Tim Ash. Couldn't see you with the hat and the mask on. Um, Liz Curry, are you still a school board member? Okay. Um, we have uh, candidate for Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray, City Councilor Joan Shannon. Um, did I miss anybody who's present right now? I also want to recognize um, there are some elected officials who uh, honored the 25 person limit on our behalf and are doing watch parties, Mayor Murrow Weinberger and City Councilor Karen Paul. So we really value that you're here with us. As you know, as well as we do, um, we really want you to be here to listen, absorb and act in the future. So I hope what you hear today inspires you to continue to uphold and uplift black lives in the state. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joy Dixon. Thank you, Keisha. Hello, my name is Joy Dixon, and today I'd like to share the meaning of Juneteenth and its significance today. June 19th marks a special celebration for communities across the United States. Celebrated as Juneteenth, a combination of June and the 19th, the holiday recognizes when the U.S. ended its historic practice of slavery legally and in the real world. Many people wonder how Juneteenth even originated. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. Its intent was to preserve the Union rather than to abolish slavery. Despite that original intent, 
the Emancipation Proclamation still declared that all enslaved people were to be free. Despite this, it wasn't until two and a half years later, on June 19, 1865, that Union soldiers arrived in Galveston, Texas, with news that the war had ended and that enslaved people were free. Note again, this was two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was decreed. Naturally, the reactions to this profound news range from pure shock to immediate jubilation. Now, although slavery wouldn't end in all states until December 1865 ratification of the 13th Amendment, June 19th, which became known as Juneteenth or Emancipation Day, was the day when the last American slaves were freed and is celebrated across our nation. As of today, 45 states and Washington, D.C. recognize the day as a state holiday, including Vermont, which was the 29th state in the nation to recognize Juneteenth as a state holiday in 2008. Despite the continuous efforts of various activists, Juneteenth still has not become a national holiday. However, it has lived on through rich traditions, including lively celebrations in the form of festivals and parades, music, and stories. Yes, Juneteenth is a time of celebration, and that includes storytelling, recounting of a past of struggle, and finding hope despite the consistent systematic racism at every turn. In 2020, we are in the middle of a health pandemic and a societal one. The pandemic affecting society has festered at America's core and oozed anti-black sentiment for hundreds of years. Juneteenth represents the good and the bad of what makes the U.S. the country it is. Juneteenth is symbolic of a liberation, but one that was delayed due to consistent opposition and resistance to equality that is deeply rooted in white supremacy. Something that all too often feels very American. From the original Juneteenth to 2020's Juneteenth, black people have endured a continuous fight for equality and a different kind of freedom. What Juneteenth symbolizes is a true day of liberation. That's something we're celebrating and a freedom worth fighting for. Happy Juneteenth. Thank you. And we will now bring up Mandy to share today's So we know that a lot of this is white folks' work to ensure the liberation and freedom of their black brothers and sisters and siblings. And uh, we had a third co-host who couldn't be here due to medical reasons, Hope Lindsay, but we did want to honor that. Uh, she's part of the reason we're all here today. She really wanted to do something as um, a, a white woman ally in South Burlington. And Representative Maida Townsend is going to read uh, some of her remarks since she couldn't be here. Good morning. Here's the message from Hope Lindsay. Dear friends, I apologize for my old body, which fails me today. It does that sometimes. I will be watching the live streaming, so I want you to know I am very much with you. Keisha wanted me to tell you how I came to her for help in organizing today's event. Weeks ago, I saw a banner, a banner during an early march for Black Lives Matter, which said, white people, do something. I reached out to Keisha on Facebook, and she took it from there. This wonderful gathering is that something, and I hope just the beginning of so much more. The following statement is a quote for white people, which applies to me and has motivated my activism too. Quote, I know I have internalized racism inside me, and I am actively doing the work to counter it. Call me out when I fail, and I will do the work to educate myself and become better. End of quote. And here is a poem by Ursula Le Guin in which I, Hope, 
have changed a few words to meet today's needs. The poem. You know what it was like for you. You know, and now I know. That is why we are here. We are not going back to the old days. We are not going to let anybody in this country have that kind of power over any of us anymore. There are great powers outside the government and in it trying to dictate the return of white supremacy. We are not great powers, but we are the light. Nobody can put us out. May all of you shine very bright and steady today and always. The words of Ursula Le Guin and Hope Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking on behalf of Ms. Hope Lindsay. We will now have Kyle Dotson, Executive Director of the YMCA of Greater Burlington, to come up and share a few words. Kyle? sent out the agenda for this morning uh, with the suggested three to five minute speaking time allotment. I remembered something someone told me some years ago about the five B's of public speaking. Be brief, brother. Be brief. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best. Um, I think it might be fitting to start with a quote. Uh, I can only imagine there's some people in the audience who, like me, are fans of Ralph Ellison, author of what many regard to be the greatest novel of the 20th century, Invisible Man. It's one of my favorite books on America and on race. And uh, interestingly and appropriate to today, he had a book published posthumously, and it was called Juneteenth. I'm dealing with the issue that brings us here today. This quote is, some things are just too unjust for words and too ambiguous for either speech or ideas. And I share that because I sometimes feel that way as I move through the emotional and cognitive experience of dealing with our current moment. Um, but it also is clear that silence uh, is not appropriate either. So I think we all come out and uh, dig down in our souls and our hearts and share what we have. So I have two ideas that I want to share um, that I think are critical for us moving forward. Um, some of my colleagues before me have mentioned this, and that is the question of whose work is this? I think that we have no shortage of um, folks who make it clear that this is white folks' work, but really it's all of our work. It's going to take a gargantuan lift for us to do this work, and it's important for all of us to do it. But the issue of white folks' work is around acknowledgement that it's white folks' work, seeing it as white folks' work. And we're having a moment now that is without precedent, as far as I'm concerned. We're seeing action and movement in places we wouldn't have seen it before. NASCAR? This morning I heard uh, something happened. I don't know if it was Branson, Missouri or Nashville, but some, you know, the home of country music. And I was thinking, like, country music, it is one of those things that, for me, is largely associated with white folks. There's Charlie Pride, old timers, you know, there's Charlie Pride, then there's Darius Rucker. But after that, that's, that, that, there might be a few more, but uh, it's not known as the bastion of, of black thought um, and creativity. But country music itself is responding. So I think there's this moment. But I think it's also important that while we're approaching this moment in sort of a, I think, a, a fight uh, in a kind of warrior fashion, which is appropriate at times, I think there's also a place for a vulnerability. And the reality, the reason that I believe it's all of our work, is because it's a collective room. I've been talking to people who are close in my life and just musing on the fact that some of us, I, I hadn't stopped to think that, it's very rare for us to see a killing on the news. When you watch the news, you usually see the aftermath. Someone has been killed, and there's tape on the ground, or we're you know, dealing with the scene, but we saw George Floyd 
have his life extinguished on TV in front of us by a representative of the state. That is traumatic. If you are thinking and feeling and moral, that has to traumatize you. And it traumatizes all of us. There are probably few Americans who aren't aware of this, haven't seen it, and we all have to live through that. And if that gets normalized, there's our humanity. Right? So we, we, we have to work on this problem together because it is our collective wound. 400 plus years, there are postcards, many people aren't aware, but you can find postcards of people in a town square watching a black body hanging from a tree. They're all white folks watching. Some of them are smiling, they're hugging. It's like being at a, at a party, it's like a cookout. But a human is hanging from a tree. That is a collective trauma. And once we all recognize that, I think we can begin to heal and move forward. So the first thing is, whose work is it? And, and hopefully that helps to share my thoughts on that. The second one is for us here in Burlington. We cannot afford to be innocent. Burlington needs to be innocent of this racial animus. Burlington loves to say, that's true, but not for us. We're standing on Church Street appropriately. We're Bernieville. This is where it all began. We think we are so progressive as to have it not exist here. And that will completely stymie us in any effort to move forward if we can't recognize we're American, we're complicit, we're part of it, we are no better. It all can exist here. I've been telling people that one of uh, the things in the current moment I think in some ways uh, offers an opportunity for us to reflect uh, in ways that are different certainly than George Floyd's situation is the Amy Cooper, Chris Cooper situation. That, uh, my contention, I don't know her, but I do not think that people in Amy Cooper's life experience her as a virulent racist. I bet she moves through life, she probably may have never had an episode like that before. And that's why it's telling, because in her moment of fear, when she was triggered, she went to a place that many have been conditioned to go to when your bathroom is against the wall. And as a result, it arguably ruined her life. And she didn't even know she had it in her. That is what we're dealing with, the fact that many white folks would have that in them because of this trauma, because of the way black bodies and black reality uh, and existence has been presented. And without acknowledging and going after it, you too could be Amy Cooper. Don't, like, if you're seeing Amy and be like, I would never behave like that, you might want to reflect a little bit and think about what happened for her and what that means about our nation, what it means about her, and what it means about um, you know, white identity, quite frankly. So I want to go back, and now after that, I just want to close, see if I can figure out my technology here, with one last quote. Once again, I'm going to return to Ralph Ellison. They can laugh, but they can't deny us. They can curse and kill us, but they can't destroy us. This land is ours because we came out of it. We bled in it. Our tears watered it. We fertilized it with our dead. So the more of us they destroy, the more it becomes filled with the spirit of our redemption. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. And Kyle is going to leave and go to his son's graduation party from BHS. So thank you for being here thank before you. that. Next up, uh, we have a gentleman who it might not be my place to say, but I would dare say that he should be the Black Poet Laureate of Vermont, Rajni Adams. Lynching is not dead. It's done in broad daylight. Under the hot lights of media frenzy, the black blood, white guilt, white fear, and white acquittal, where brown boys are still expendable. Michael Vick should have had Zimmerman's lawyer. Brown boys are worth less than black dogs. Trayvon should have been a brown lab. Maybe then we see more of a humane society's presence. If poems could march in the streets, overturn verdicts, bring corrupt police to justice, if they could bring a boy back his life and a mother back her son, a father back his boy, return bullets to a gun, 
unloose the lynch rope and unravel the knots from choked throats, we would not be choking on tears. When do our lives become valuable? In the eyes of the law. When does hate cease to be exonerated behind the badge and lighter skin? And God forbid you wear a hoodie in the rain while having black skin with Skittles in your pocket. You can taste the rainbow, but you can't taste freedom. You can taste your own blood, but you can't taste the rainbow. Diversity is white people's code word for niggers. You can taste the rainbow, but not if you're too dark. The rainbow may come during the storm. If you're too dark on a block in a hoodie and the skills fall from your pocket, you never taste the rainbow. Your killer has the right to stand his ground. He may shoot you in the heart and America may relive it in sordid detail. She is only reliving her nightmare. She dreams nightmares often. Open caskets, ashes, weighted limbs, no coffins. Two, his name is George Floyd, say it. Ahmaud Arbery. Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Breonna Taylor. Jerome, Urban King. Jerome Urban King, Manuel Ellis, Manuel Ellis. Derek Scott, Derek Scott. Rayshard, Brooks. Rayshard Brooks, Ayad Al Halak, Renee Davis, Renee Davis. Trayvon, Martin. Trayvon Martin, Khalif Browder, Khalif Browder. Corey, Jones. Corey Jones, Freddie Gray. Terrence Sterling, Terrence Crutcher, Terrence Crutcher. Joseph, Mann. Joseph Mann, D. Wiggum, D. Wiggum. Keith Lamont Scott, Jarevis Scrubs, DeAndre Joshua, Philando Castillo, Alton Sterling, Sterling. Corin Gaines, Gaines, Oscar Grant, Oscar Grant. Mackenzie Cochran, Cochran, Jordan Baker, Jordan the Charleston Nine, Charleston Andy Lopez, Lopez. Kamani Gray, Gray, Mary Eugene Stanberry, Sean Bell, Bell, Sandra Bland, Bland, Raynette Turner, Turner, Natasha McKenna, Kendra Chapman, 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 Joyce Cornell, Cornell, Burkina Jones, Jones, Samuel Samuel Hose, Maya Hall, Hall, Alicia Thomas, Thomas, Tarika Wilson, Wilson, Joy Good, Jivon McDade, Benzel Hampton, Hermes Ashkodom, Aaron Campbell, Alonzo Ashley, Renell Lewis, Wendell Allen, Dante Parker, Victor White, John Crawford, Ezell Ford, Omar Abrego, Keith Vidal, Michael Brown, Jordan Davis, Akai Gurley, Romaine Brisbane, Darian Hunt, Kajim Powell, Tamir Rice, Jason Harrison, Uzman Zongo, Jack Jacquez, Manuel Loggins, Kendra McDade, Rakia Boyd, Maria Godinez, David Latham, Yvette Smith, Luis Rodriguez, Matthew Paolo, Amadou Diallo, his name, he has a name. His name is I Can't Breathe. His name is Emmett Till. Emmett Till. His name, his name, his name. You must remember his name. James Byrd Jr. James Jr. You may whisper it in the wind. You may hear it in your skin. His name is guilty. In his innocence. Freedom fighter. Martyr. Troublemaker. His name. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, he has a name. His name is Black Boy. Blacklisted, blackballed, his name is Black Power, black babies in the black market for green cash, stolen life, tied to a tree, burnt at the stake, his name, probable cause, the Negro problem, chalk outline, white man's fear, his name ear for a souvenir, his name black nigger boy. Fred Hampton, Huey P. Newton, Mega Evers, his name saves lives, mobilizes movements, his name is Rational Black Messiah. Bullet to the heart. Boy in jaws of boom. White girl card rape. Whistle too free. Head too high. His name looked me in my eye. His name must die. Gangster, thug, menace, stereotype. His name is wretched like demon. His name is taken to the bridge on Main Street. His name, his name's legs, the plume to his neck, cracks. 
stabbed, hung, shot, burned, ravaged by relic hunters. His name is mistaken identity. Scottsboro Boys, Tuskegee Experiments, David Walker, living, breathing, black manhood, heathen, pagan, no salvation. His name is, you free nigga, nigga, over it. Kuta Kinte, Southern Africa, strange fruit, stranger in a strange land, in danger of deranged hands, enemy of the state, genetic dissenter, asphalt art, bloody memory, collateral damage, white man's burden, that happened so long ago. Chain gang, wage slave, chattel, on the rack, in the irons, on the one, one, wanted. His name is Arthur Cairns the Fort, but this is the cotton. His name is put your hands up. Spread them. Stop or shoot. His name is Bang! 41 shots. Asada Shakur, Angela Davis, breakfast program. Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. His name is, his name is, he has a name. His name is beaten severely, urinated and unchained by the ankles. His name is dragged for three miles and decapitated. Eighty-one places have their names. His name is missing an arm. His name is crackhead, war on drugs, war on poverty, scapegoat, sacrificial lamb. His name is kicked carcass, convict, criminal, thief, drug dealer, victim. Still a child, his name will never breathe again. His name has a mother. His name is expendable. Sundown laws. Jim Crow cars. Jim Crow bars. His name is racial profiling. In court, just call him profiling. Because this is not about race. His name is Marcus Garvey. Frederick Douglass. Ida B. Rose. No rights a white man is bound to respect. His name is a title. When he dies, his name is Mr. Martin. Wearer of the black hoodie. Walker of the home path. Wrong place, wrong time. Wrong skin, wrong crime. His name is holder of the Skittles. His name, his mother knows his name. Her tears spill it in bold, big bold letters down her cheeks. His name is gone too soon. His name is Darkie, Spook, Jigaboo, Sambo. His name is different. Too difficult to be pronounced by thin lips with forked tongues. His name dies without justice. Missing. Lost. Bottom of the ocean. Shark food. Trying to trade of littered bones. His name is Sunchild. Starfruit. Young, gifted, and black but you can call him nigger. His name. He has a name. His name is the sun is rising. His name is wake up! I know his name. Because his name is mine. for that powerful, powerful poem. As you were reading that, I just kept thinking, those are the ones we know about. Please take that into consideration that there's so many other lives being taken across this nation that have not been filmed, whose lives are dying in vain. We'll now bring up Katrina Battle. Katrina? So we will move forward with our program. And also, there's a lot of elected officials out here. I mean, that Port Laureate title sounds pretty good to me. So thank you so much again, Rajni. Next we'll have Jabari Jones, local racial justice activist, healer, and faker. Renaissance man, come on up. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Not everything can hear me. Okay. 
I'm glad they were doing this down here instead of up there, because then y'all wouldn't be able to see my socks. So just check that out. It's important to find some joy even in the midst of immense suffering. I remind us how we remind ourselves that we are still human, and that's what we're fighting for. I forgot I had it on. <laughs> Black people are free. That's right. Black people are free. <laughs> Black people are free. The problem is, we live in an unfree place. And we have been traumatized by this unfreedom the last damn near 500 years. So while we are free, our liberation is not complete. The thing that prevents the liberation of this place we're in is whiteness. We're completely described as imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, cis hetero patriarchy. Globalized system of interlocking systems, domination, and control. The system that is at this very hour convulsing towards its final reckoning. Dear white people, don't worry about freeing black people. We are free. Free yourselves. Free yourselves of the addictive need. I emphasize that addictive need to dominate and control, which results in the morbidity and death of black people. Free yourselves of an identity that is based solely on being not black. Free yourselves of the delusion of whiteness, which is the illusion of freedom, the illusion of separation, the illusion of superiority, the illusion of innocence. Break the spell that has kept you asleep for centuries because your bed is on fire. Wake up now. That is your work. The mod exceptionalism is dead. Yeah. We're here today to celebrate, commemorate Juneteenth, but where was Dinah's jubilee? Dinah, an African woman who was enslaved sold to Judge Stephen Jacob of Windsor, Vermont in 1783, while Vermont was still its own republic, while the Vermont Constitution forbade adults from being held in slavery. Where was the announcement of freedom from bondage for the African owns, Africans owned by the family of Ethan Allen? White supremacy has deep roots in the rocky soil of Vermont. Vermont exceptionalism is dead. The only thing that is truly exceptionable, exceptional, exceptional, exceptional about Vermont is that it is exceptionally white. Black people are free. In order to complete our liberation in Vermont, we need the time, the space, and the land in which to heal to breathe, to just simply be. When the announcement arrived in Galveston, Texas, the Africans enslaved there didn't wait for the ink to dry. They fled immediately. They fled immediately looking for their family and their friends 
sold off to slavery and other plantations so that they could reunite with them and find a place, a free place, in which to stand and to live out their complete liberation. We are still searching. In order to complete our liberation, white supremacy needs to die. Black people are free. Free Vermont. Black lives matter. Black trans lives matter. Black disabled lives matter. All black lives matter, and no black lives matter at all. This woman really needs no introduction. I would dare call her the hardest working woman in Vermont. Tabitha Moore, the president of the Rutland NAACP and the state director for the Vermont NAACP. Write that down. Put this over here. Thank you. I don't need any corona today. We're not that kind. But maybe after I say this, I might need a different kind. So, can you hear me, first of all? I know it's kind of a little bit difficult to hear. You hear me in? All right, just raise a hand if you can't, or if you need me to repeat something, either because you can't hear it or you didn't understand it, because I'm going to say some things that need to be understood. So, as Keisha mentioned, I work um, a lot of different jobs from a lot of different angles, and one of those things is trying to work with our law enforcement system on how do we change to be more fair and impartial. And lately, They've been on fire, and I'm like, good. <laughs> you should be, because we're dying. And they're being responsive, we're trying to be. But it's really been fascinating in my role, because I hear a lot of people in different positions saying the same thing from different ways. And so my remarks today are kind of geared toward, toward that sort of very, very, very tiny, thin, fragile road where we might actually be able to make inroads. Mr. Donovan, I hope you take your notes. So, I'm not one for the, can't we all just get along kind of bent, because that's just not real. That's not how systemic racism works. That's not how you undo systems of supremacy. <laughs> it's about culture. And the conversation today has revolved around the question, how do we out-policy or out-legislate racism? And I'm not convinced that that's the right question to be asking, mainly because we're still dying still experiencing discrimination in every system, from education to healthcare and economics to judicial and law enforcement. And all along the way, black and brown folks have been more than patient. We have jumped through every loop, given every statistic, come to your table, invited us to our, invited you to ours, dialogued and discussed, strategized and powerpointed the issue to the point where any time anyone on any side of the issue even thinks about or, or suggests that we do another committee or task force, we all collectively roll our eyes because we know that doesn't work. We are still dying. So what now? Well, listen to us. Follow us. Don't just listen to us. Follow us. Now is the time for radical action. Try the path of the indigenous peoples of the brown and black cultures who endured supremacy and genocide and still thrive to the point where white cultures emulate our music, our food, our styles, and our ways of being in so many other realms. Black excellence. Happy Juneteenth. White people now call it restorative practices or restorative justice. Or justice. But we just call it community. We call it justice because to us, justice is always restorative and always invites people in rather than excluding them through law enforcement or um, jail systems. So, now is the time for a restorative approach to deconstructing white supremacy in our systems, starting with law enforcement. I know my friends and colleagues and community from the field of law enforcement here defund the police as a direct threat. And in some ways it is, but that's not what I hear. I hear an agreement. I hear an agreement that we have put too many mandates on our law enforcement system. A declaration which I have heard from brown and black folks as well, only for us it sounds like too much power. It sounds like I can't breathe. It sounds like underfunded resources. But we're all saying the same thing. 
And what we are saying that we need to do is a massive overhaul of not just law enforcement, but of our community resources. We cannot and should not rely on police to take care of us when we're having a massive mental health issue. Not only does, does that kill us, but we also know that law enforcement is not the right response. It is not a restorative response to mental health need. It is not the right response to homelessness. We should not be calling the police when we know that there's a homeless person out here having an issue. That is not what we need. It's not even the right response to squabbling neighbors who are fighting over whose flowers or over whose gardens. We, as a community, have the power to change those things, to do our own relationships. That's where the change needs to be. It's time for the community to reinvest our own, in our own power, to manage ourselves and our relationships, to invest money and resources into mobile mental health units and restorative approaches to harm done wherever it occurs in our community. That is what we mean when we say defund the police. It means reinvesting in other areas. And if we are to do this in a truly transformative way, if we are to make real progress and to end white supremacy, white supremacy peacefully, as I know we all want to do, and make no mistake, white supremacy is going to end one way or another. <laughs> but white folks, especially those in great power, you must get on the same page with us. Get on our page with brown and black folks and our demands to be restored. Follow our lead and honor our expertise. That is the only way this will end peacefully. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tabitha. I'm going to try and experiment for a second and see if folks can hear me. Okay, we're getting some feedback with the speaker, and I'm wondering if our live streams can still pick up my voice, if you think so. Yeah. Iffy? Okay. Well, maybe, maybe we'll get a little closer, but I, I think the feedback is making it a little bit difficult to hear. So, um, if you are a, a speaker who needs a, the microphone, definitely Hi. turn it on and use it. You need it. Yeah. Okay. okay, and it was better. It was still better, even with the feedback. Then what I think I'm going to say is if people hold it down here, that probably helps a lot. Oh, okay. Okay. No, you were fine. Everybody's fine. Um, thank you, Tabitha. You're fine, girl. You're, you're good. We love you. <laughs> we'll hold the microphone down here. And um, I'll you. Oh, okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, so our next speaker um, is one of the young people that I really see as helping to lead the way. Uh, you know, she has taken the University of Vermont by storm, uh, and she's, I think, just getting into her senior year. Activist, author, advocate, Harmony Adosamwan. Every, wait, down here? Yeah, yeah. Are we good? Yeah. Can you hear me? I feel like I don't need it, but I'm just going to use it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Harmony Adosawan. Uh, I don't really have much to say. I guess my first thing is I like to talk directly to white people because I just feel like y'all are the issue. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the white supremacy in y'all's hearts and if we can deal with that. Um, I do believe that things need to be done on, more, on a more structural level, but it starts on an individual level, and if you're not, <laughs> um, if you're not addressing the racism that exists inside your heart, especially folks in Burlington, I feel like a lot of the time folks feel like this place is a generally liberal place, and it's a generally like okay place. I remember reading the comments based on the, the feedback from the protests that we had at Battery Park, a lot of folks kept saying, why are you protesting here in Burlington? Like, it's a good place to be. And it's like, did you not hear about what happened to the Melly Brothers? Did you not hear about the killing that happened outside the UVM Medical Center? Like, there are issues here in Burlington, and I just want to just bring that, like, to the table. Um, Vermont, per pervasive whiteness isn't normal. I say this a lot. Vermont isn't so white for no reason. It's not because people of color don't like the cold weather. It's, that's not the truth. Um, what reminds white because there was literally charters that said people of color couldn't own land here. Like, it was, Vermont's almost like a safe haven for white people to come here to be away from other black and brown people. Um, so just think of it like that. Like, Vermont is white and it's because of a structural reason. I guess the next thing I want to say is 
just address the racism that exists inside your hearts. Like, just because you're woke does not mean that you're doing enough. You're either a racist or a recovering racist. There's, like, white people, like, you're, the way American culture is, you're conditioned to be racist, there's no way around it. So just address yourself. What are you? Are you racist? Are you a, a recovering racist? What are you going to do about that? And um, just read books. Stop hitting up black folks. Stop hitting up your black friends asking them for advice. Literally, Google is free. It was made in 98, I think. Like, it's been around for a really long time. Just use Google. There's so many things on there. That, and there's actually people of color that have even went out of their way to write books to help y'all. Just like, you know, don't buy from Amazon. I prefer if you buy from, like, black-owned bookstores because, like, you know, you can get them shipped and stuff. But just read a book. Um, use Google. Understand your placement. Talk to your family. Stop being quiet. Speak up. Stop being scared. And I guess the last point I want to make is just I feel like Burlington is just too polite. There's no right way to protest. There's no right way to do anything. I'm more on the radical side of things. <laughs> the, the right side. I've, heard, I've had a lot of people tell me I was doing things wrong. But apart from that, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. I'm the type of person that it's like, if I have something to say, I'm gonna say it, and y'all are all gonna listen regardless. <laughs> but yes, Burl just stop being so polite. Stop being so nice to racists. There's no, like, stop excusing them. I see a lot of time on Facebook. <laughs> like, just from studying, since being in Vermont, I just, I just study white people, and I've noticed that there's a thing in your culture where you say things like, oh, he's a nice guy. He didn't really, that's familiar. I see a lot of nods going around. <laughs> he's a nice guy. He grew up in, like, a nice neighborhood. He had, like, he didn't really mean any harm by it. He didn't mean to nail on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. He's a nice guy. He cares for his, his community. He does this. He does that. And it's like, dudes, like, no. Stop being so polite. Like, scream at people. Like, if you see a ra like, literally tell them to shut the fuck up and stop being so, like, stop it. Like, don't be afraid to curse. Don't be afraid to show your anger. Don't be afraid to, like, really, like, this is white supremacy we're talking about. These are people's lives. Like, stop this whole, like, we're gonna like peacefully walk through the streets and show that how peaceful, like no, if you wanna tear down this whole place, do it, because people's lives are on the line, people are dying, guys. <laughs> but like people aren't breathing anymore. Like, just get that within yourselves, and okay, that's basically that. But happy Juneteenth. Understand where you are in the world, recovering racist, racist. Have a good day. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tommy. We will now have Kaya from Rights and Democracy. Kaya Morris from Rights and Democracy. Yes, keep the applause coming. So, I want to thank you everyone for being here and being a part of this. And I am speaking on behalf of Rights and Democracy, and we are a uh, political organization that is really trying to mobilize people across the state to get into the work of doing the kind of progressive reforms and policies that are necessary to liberate us all. So what I need to sit with you all today is the considerations of what this means for people to have political power and for folks to actually hold seats of political power and how it dramatically transforms the everyday lived experiences of individuals that you may never know, but you will absolutely impact. What I need to say today is a little sobering. We're here celebrating Juneteenth, which is really around the abolition of slavery. Understand right now that there are elected officials that at this same decision to end to abolish, not gently transition out, but to abolish the enslavement of human beings would struggle with that decision today. They would struggle deeply with whether or not it was the right choice because there's economic impacts and what are we gonna do? How are we gonna make those folks whole? Because it's gonna change the whole fabric of our society and because you know, Really, if we start to see everyone as human, then we have to give that mandate and fulfill the social contract of upholding human rights. These were literal con 
conversations that took place years before the abolition of slavery happened. It was a calculated decision to delay the decisions, and then those decisions were only half measured. And that is why we are here today talking about Juneteenth. Those were elected officials put into place through voting power by people who are not held accountable, who did not have a moral compass, and who were easily swayed and confused by the work that they're supposed to be doing. We see this, and I'm not just saying this just to be provocative. We have not ended slavery because we still have a deeply profitable prison industrial complex. There are elected officials in this state who struggled with the decision on whether or not to move our black prisoners to Mississippi, one of the worst states for civil rights violations against black and brown bodies in this nation, and that was an acceptable choice? This is how we treat people in the state of Vermont? Many of these individuals who were caught up in a criminal justice system that continu continually recycled them in and out of prison systems through unfair laws which were passed by elected officials that were implemented and reified by judges who were in many cases elected officials. It is an entire system that has been completely reliant upon the wisdom, the goodwill, and the willingness of those who hold those seats of power to ever hold a critical lens as to what they're actually tangibly doing. We see this, even as well, how slavery continues in the fight for minimum wage, which is pathetic. Yeah. It is not a live, it's not a livable wage. It's not even a dignified wage that folks are fighting for. The expectation is your labor is unimportant you are to use your body, your time, your talents, your energy for the profit of someone else and you are to live on a subservient amount to do so. And we are not willing as a society to do what is necessary to change that. Those are decisions being made by people in elected office. And I'm speaking with this ferocity right now because there are people that are dead fighting for these things. These have been fighting for union organizing rights, collective bargaining rights. They died. They were slaughtered by sheriffs, by military, all put in place, funded, and supported through a political system of electoral politics. Understand that this is real. Understand that as a state, we could get behind supporting our small businesses. As a nation, we were able to create Funding streams to keep our hospitals open, to give them a baseline amount. We can't do minimum wage. We can't do universal basic income. But now we can see very clearly the effects, because we needed someone else to see those effects before the people could actually see those effects, for us to ever see that there was a value in it. What is that saying? What is this telling us? Our rights to vote. There were municipalities throughout the state who have gone through and wrestled with the decision around whether or not to grant undocumented persons in our state their right to vote. Do you know that the legislature voted that charter down? A municipality went through the deliberate process of saying we want to provide this important fundamental right to our undocumented brothers and sisters and people in elected office said, nah. We see this in the fight for vote by mail. The legislature had to take action because there were elected officials who did not believe that in the middle of a pandemic, we could ever adjust our society in a way to support the, hi the history of health and dignity of individuals to not have to risk their lives to exercise their constitutional rights. This is a question. These are questions that people are wrestling with. In what reality other than a surreal one? Our rights to equal access to education. We know that there's disparate funding. There are unequal educational experiences happening in schools throughout this state. There are schools, my son's school didn't even have the floors waxed on the first day of school. And his kindergarten bathroom wasn't even working on the first day of school. There are schools where they're sending kids across 
the country and to foreign nations to visit, and yet there are schools in this state that don't have the baseline supplies they need. That is a problem that was put in place with a system of folks who are in elected office. Are you hearing me on this? One of the things I want you to keep in mind, it's a quote that's often brought up during these times when we're thinking about what does racial justice mean? And how do we get there? We want to go back and we want to look at Martin Luther King Jr. And he says that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, right? So how long is this arc supposed to be? Because the systems of oppression did not wait and have a 10-point plan with a five-year transition to come onto this nation and to slaughter the indigenous. They did not go and negotiate with African tribes and say, is that cool if we build a system of chattel slavery? But we're going to go through the next couple hundred years of generations of breeding you and forcing you to work for our benefit? Was there a negotiation there? Was there careful deliberation with the people that were impacted? Absolutely not. So there is no reason why we have to be afraid of the kind of progressive reforms that are necessary because that power system was absolutely able to shift gears as it needed to, to support and maintain its systems of power. So we must dismantle them with equal energy, courage, and temerity. I want to be clear to say that there are absolutely champions on every level, but there are not enough. And there are not enough of us. And there is not enough diversity. And there is no excuse. We are out of excuses. These decisions get made as small as thinking about where you get to live. We've got redlining of districts. We've got disparate funding for people who are trying to do construction projects. And you know what? Many of these areas that are white, there was a professor at UVM who wrote a fantastic book that you can also Google and find talking about sundown towns. And those include the policies, the procedures, the covenants that were built into neighborhoods, towns, and communities to keep those who are not white, cisgendered, able-bodied, Christian, and male out of spaces that were deemed sacred. We cannot have representation by proxy. If we do not, and I am speaking to our marginalized folks, I am speaking to our black community here in Vermont, I am speaking to you today. Don't wait for somebody on your school board to fix your school, get on that school board. If you are youth and you don't have a voice in your educational system, you make a way, you find a way. And it does not have to only come in two minute bites on a Zoom call. It should happen on a regular basis and with you actually in those seats. Our party system will often tell you that it's not your time to run, and I'm here to tell you that that's crap. That's right. yeah. It is your right to run at any time. You do not have to wait for a better day. You do not have to wait for a better time. You come as your authentic self and you fight like hell, because that's what we're in. It's a fight for our lives. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been able to speak to you today about this. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with you all today and for this celebration. There will be more. I want to also just quickly give a shout out to this project that Temple OZ has been doing with black leaders across the state called the Stopping Stones Project. And we're hoping to install in front of Ski Rack a memorial to the slaves that Ethan Allen held because that's where they lived. Yeah. And we're working on that and this pandemic has slowed down this work so we would have loved to have had it ready by now. But we're going to still need you all, we're going to need your support, we're going to need your finances, we're going to need you to make sure that this history is not forgotten. I want to thank you, and I'm going to leave. Kaya, wherever you lead, you will follow. Thank you so much. Uh, we're trying to make this a truly grassroots event and honor black folks who have come who do want to say a few words as well. Um, before I do that, I wanted to note a few things. Um, turn it one, on. Turn it on. Oh, I didn't do it. Number one, um, and this is an important one, there are some folks who are speaking here today that you've heard from, you've appreciated, who have inspired you, who are seeking contributions and are, are happy to take any resources you might be able to provide for their work, which is often underfunded. 
Uh, you will find that information on all of the social media events related to, to the Juneteenth event. Um, so please consider supporting those folks. In fact, there was a spreadsheet up of a lot of black Vermonters and it has been tampered with. Um, so it is down, but these are folks that you can directly support. Um, and you can support Rights and Democracy and the NAACP by becoming a member and a lot of other organizations that are represented here. So I hope you'll consider doing that. Um, I want to take a moment to thank Haley Summer, Cecilia Field, Eamon Dunn, and Maya Voda and CCTV for filming this for us today. Um, a lot of high school and college students who are making this event happen. And with that, I also really want to thank Skylar Nash, uh, who helped to put this event together, who's standing in the back looking at me crazy. And um, he has been worried about the rain. I think it's going to pass, uh, but he wanted to really contribute his time to a couple other folks. Um, and y'all should know Skylar Nash, a criminal justice reform advocate, has been doing a lot of diversity and equity work with UVM Athletics and is the only black campaign manager in the state this year. So fielding a lot uh, and doing a great job. And I really appreciate him. Thank you, Skylar. So we're gonna uh, turn it over to a couple local activists who are going to say a few words about what they're up to. First up is Bruce Wilson. Hello everyone. First of all, I'd like to um, thank you all for coming out today. You know, all you wonderful people and the people who are streaming online right now, thank you very much. So I'm Bruce Wilson, Executive Director of Service Rendered Incorporated and Art So Wonderful. And um, I'm just going to say that I came here in, in um, 1989 and, uh, to Vermont. And, um, we, you know, I've been on a lot of racial justice a lot of racial justice boards and committees and advisories around the state from the central from the central level to the uh, local level and so I've seen a lot I've done a lot and um, and so all I know is this you know and we had to work hard right because in 1989 when I got here this was the whitest state in America and so what really changed that I know for a fact that what really changed is it's probably like the third whitest state now so black people, uh, people of color, have made a difference. We have made a difference, you know, because it's obviously the numbers have changed. But basically, I will come up here to say to you that um, um, my art program, Art So Wonderful, have done this incredible Black Lives Matter mural on Union Street on the old YMCA building. So if you get time, go check it out. Um, it's a beautiful mural. My art. Um, one of my artists through our programs, you know, we're just going to do that wall because we have a graffiti abatement program. We do all those cool murals you see all around town. Um, um, we're just going to put some beautiful flowers up there. So I asked her, God, you know, can you put like a Black Lives Matter up there? She's like, who's how flowers going to look with Black Lives Matter uh, missions? But it looks really beautiful, you know. And so I just want to end with this that, um, you know, part of Vermont's mission goals and objectives, you know, and their motto is like, Unity and freedom. Unity and freedom, right? That's one of the reasons why I came to Vermont, because they said, damn, the universe, unity and freedom. Underground Railroad came from here. It was against slavery, you know? And um, how wonderful is that? You know, why the state of America is doing those things, you know? And so I think let's take, let's admit to the following on unity and freedom for all in Vermont. Let's work real hard to, to, to make sure that we all you know, can uh, figure out ways to work together. And that, that's the best thing I could do. I would always tell my team and staff that I have 195 PhDs because I work with the people who are, who knows, you know. I see people who are here, like Johanna Bryant. They, they know that's what I do, you know. I work with all of you to meet, meet our mission goals and objectives. And, and because of that, we have a lot of things going on. So thank you again for coming out. And uh, go check out the uh, Black Lives Mural. Or my uh, art director, Ali, will say, uh, tag it and send it to at Art So Wonderful. You know, we can put you know put it on our um, social media. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Bruce. And last but not least, we'll have Karen Sita, who is your Miss Black Vermont. I just came from camping. First time going fishing. Try it. Changed my life. Um, I just want to let y'all know, uh, just to be yourself to my black girls in the state of Vermont, we make the 1%, but we make Vermont 100%.
I don't care what nobody says. Yes, we're 1%, but without the black people in Vermont, without the African market in North Street, without the Somalians, without the Burundi, without the Congolese, we would not be Vermont, okay? And black royalty exists. We have black kids all up in UVM. We have black kids at Champlain. We have black kids at Edmonds, Hunt. All our black girls need to be reminded that they are queens, that they are smart, that they are able, and they are kind, and you need to be yourself. See, I grew up in South Burlington, predominantly white school. If I listened to all these people, what they wanted me to be, I would not stand here as Miss Black Vermont being proud to be black. So I'm here to encourage everybody, even my white folks, be proud of who you are and work together with people. Work together. It's about individual. Be who you are. Love people. Let who you are be love. Let who you are be kindness. Let who you are be joy. And together, we can make Vermont great. We don't have to be our past. No one has to be their past. We can look at our future. And don't listen to these Twitter people. My Angela Davis is alive, y'all. She's not dead. She's alive. She lives in Atlanta, Georgia. OK? Don't listen to Twitter. Don't listen to the randoms. Listen to the people who have been in this fight. Listen to the people who understand and are willing to educate and teach you. But the ones that don't, let them figure out their own process, too. We are all learning. And we are all just trying to figure out. And some of us already know, too. Some of us are learning, some of us already know. So you need to figure out who knows and who's learning and work together. Okay, power to the people. Okay, Ms. Black, come on. Thank you, Karen. So next up, we have a business leader in the community, Ms. Ashley Laporte. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Hope, for bringing us all together here today. Coming together with black people and other people of color has been bringing me great comfort in these days. Thank you for creating space for us. My name is Ashley Laporte. I grew up in Stowe. I now live in Burlington. And I'm here speaking today simply as a member of this community, as a black Vermonter. I'm here today to speak directly to the black people in Vermont and to our fellow people of color. As this state raises its collective consciousness around racism and white privilege, I've been asked to speak to white people about these issues, to join task forces led by white people. And of course, I see where there's value in that. And I'll create the time and I'll create space for it, but not today. Today is for us. So to my black people, to my brown people, to my people of color, let's talk this morning about resilience. I've been thinking a lot about resilience in this moment that we're in. When I say resilience, I'm talking about the ability to both survive and to thrive. And I'm talking about the importance of taking care of ourselves as we fight for each other. I have found myself simultaneously energized and exhausted recently. On the one hand, we're at an important tipping point in our collective history. We once again have in front of us an opportunity to make real progress when it comes to the liberation of black people in this country. Thanks to our brothers and sisters who are marching in the streets across our cities, facing police brutality, speaking truth to power, our country is seeing black people in this nation are still not free. We've caught the attention of every major news network every social media feed of our political system. We are and should take advantage of this moment, raise our voices, be in the street, demand what should be demanded, defund the police. But I am also exhausted, especially here in Vermont, explaining that racism is alive and well in our state, trying to show up for black activists like Harmony, Noelle Rigby Williams, my friend Evelyn in Colchester, the young women organizing the demonstrations that are getting noticed. I'm joining task forces, calling on my representatives, watching people get tear gassed in our own country. I'm going to work and trying to maintain a professional demeanor. I'm answering questions and well-intended texts of solidarity from the white people in my life, of which there are many. And so I've been thinking a lot about resilience how to be resilient in this work, how to simultaneously live up to the moment we're in and to prepare for the long haul, because we need to do both. And I've been asking myself, 
Do I have it in me? And I wonder if some of you other black people have been asking yourself the same thing. And as I reflect on this, I take a deep breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. I take a walk to think about it. I take my big black body up to our big mountains and I reflect. And I know, of course, I have it in me because I'm surviving and I'm thriving in a world that seems to be doing everything in its power to get rid of me. Every day under the pressure of white supremacy and of under whiteness, growing up a poor, a poor black girl with a white mom in Stowe, Vermont, being a black girl in a New England boarding school, being a black woman in business, I've been taking deep breaths and putting myself back together my whole life. When I was told I couldn't play house with my classmates because I was black and white people don't marry black people, and then I went back to class. When I was a black child at the lake with my white mom and the Fresh Air Kids program coordinator rounded my sister and I up with the other black kids because they thought, of course, we didn't live here. And then we drove home as though nothing had happened. When I called out daddy to the only other black man in our town because I thought he was mine, or maybe I just wished that he was mine. The first time I was called a nigger and the too many white times after that. Every time I'm at a department store in this city and I'm shopping and I'm asked, hey, do you work here? When I'm stopped speeding by the police and I hit record on my phone, when I disagree in a meeting and I can tell my strong opinion delivered confidently is making people uncomfortable. Seeing the Confederate flag at the lake where my family holds its annual reunion, on the sticker on the back of the truck in front of me and the Confederate flags on the lawns of people's homes. I have built mechanisms to keep going under all the weight. And my weight is light compared to so many of my black brothers and sisters whose weight is the weight of air pollution on their lungs because our nation builds polluting factories in black communities. The weight of a stop and frisk on the way home from school the weight of an officer's knee on your neck. And still we rise from underneath the weight this white world keeps piling on us. As Audre Lorde says in a litany of survival, we were never meant to survive. We should find strength in that, not in a look how far we've come kind of way, but in a we're still here, we are still fighting kind of way in a against all odds, against the systems that continually push us down, we are still here and we've risen up again. Yes. The power of this, we are a resilient people that we can both fight in the here and now and we can lean into our tiredness, that doing this is not giving up, that self-care is a radical act something else Audrey Lord also taught us. That we're allowed to sit in our exhaustion and acknowledge it. Notice the hurt in your feet, the weight behind your eyes, the tightness in your chest, that lump in your throat, and take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth, close your eyes, Draw on the strength that you've built over time in the length of your life, but also in the strength of all the black people who have come before us. We the survivors, we the fighters, we the strong. So my message today to my black people, remember your resilience. Know you have it, know its power, and find comfort in it. We're gonna need it for the fight ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley, for those impactful words. And without further ado, we are going to have closing remarks from Right Reverend Dr. Shannon McVeigh Brown, who is the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Vermont. As she comes up, I hope that you all will continue to reflect on the words of the speakers today and 
just thank you all for coming out to our elected officials, to our speakers who graced us with your words today. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Kisha, for uh, coordinating this and all the folks that you brought together today. It has been such an honor and a pleasure. Without further ado, the Right Reverend. Well, uh, June, Juneteenth is supposed to be a day that I say supposed, so just listen. It's supposed to be a day to celebrate black people's freedom from slavery in the United States of America. And I don't want to minimize the significance of this day, but let us also remember that freedom was only granted to enslaved black people in the Confederate States on June 19, 1865. You see, the Emancipation Proclamation became a law in September of 1862 and was enacted in January of 1863. And so enslaved people from the Union States were not granted freedom until after Juneteenth. It was in December of 1865. So think about that. So as they, and this is what, uh, the killing thing, it's not in my notes, but, um, so they said, oh yes, you know, Juneteenth, um, you all are free, you can, um, and this is what they told them, you aren't slaves anymore, but you can now be employees. So they told them how they were gonna be free, or you can go somewhere else, I don't know where else, so they of course went to look for their families, or if they went to the Union States, you know, they were living with black people that were not free. Anyway, I just thought, huh, interesting. That's the way we do it here. But anyway, I don't suppose, even with all of that, I don't propose changing the celebration of freedom to a different day, but instead it is fitting that this day should encapsulate the complicated history of black people, freedom, and our place in this country. And even at the pro after the progress that we can claim um, even after a black president, this is a day about celebrating a hoped for reality that we know belongs to us, but has yet to be realized. The circumstances of Juneteenth are a reminder to us of the importance of black people retelling our stories and controlling our narrative. This helps us to better understand where we are and to notice the patterns of deception that continue in the social contract we hold with this nation. Now I'm astounded by the opportunities that have been presented to us uh, in this um, confluence brought about by the pandemic, by this COVID-19 pandemic. The national conversation about the disparities and inequities that we've lived with and the battle against the virus of racism and anti-blackness that is being fought through, through protests and demonstrations in the streets of our cities and towns. Because does Vermont even have any cities besides Burlington? I mean, I, the rest are towns, right? Yes, not just here, everywhere. And it has always been our role as black people to call this nation to accountability when it comes to freedom and even in our weariness from these uncertain times. Because I don't know about y'all, but I know I'm tired. I know that we have all noticed the new willingness of many in our nation to address the iniquities and disparities which plague our nation. Several days ago, my daughter and husband and I, we were driving around just to get a change of scenery because we've been mostly in the house. So we pulled up to a corner on the UVM campus, and there was one lone little white girl with her sign out there, Black Lives Matter, by herself. I don't know, she could have been doing something else, but that's where she was, by herself. And then the other night, maybe it was night before last, CNN had this interview of this, this white couple that lived in Arizona, and it was a fairly conservative area that they lived, but here they were, these two people, on the street with their Black Lives Matter signs. And I don't know how that, somebody noticed them. 
And of course, they were being cursed out, and you know, ima you can imagine what happened. But they also had people encouraging them. So tell me, when have you ever seen anything like that? God bless them and what they might represent. And I'm also hoping that they will have the fortitude to continue and grow in their allyship, even when they might like to retreat into the comfort of their privilege. And I'm new to Vermont. I haven't even been here for a year. And in this very, very, very white, fairly liberal state, it will be a challenge for us. I'm speaking, I don't know if you all know that I was talking to black people here, and the rest of you listen in. But anyway, um, it will be a challenge for us to not only keep people's energy and hearts focused on this work, but to also understand why it is even necessary in a place like this. They're going to wonder about that. And how do we further the cause of forward movement in the communities of Vermont? Well, I'll tell you this. I don't have all the answers. I haven't been here long enough. And, I'm, and I've heard some people that have some ideas about how to fix what's wrong. But I don't have all the answers to our particular challenge. But I do have some words of affirmation and mission for us all. Don't let your well-meaning allies off the hook. Tell them to stop aiding and abetting violence ag against blackness. Tell your allies, vote as if you have a black, indigenous, or person of color, son or daughter, grandchild, whatever. Invite your allies to share in your discomfort with telling hard truths. And I'm going to tell you, I'm speaking from experience. I know a, a lot about this, actually, as a bishop in a predominantly white denomination. Forget that, you know, if, even if I weren't here in Vermont, this is rare. There's only four other women like me in the whole Episcopal Church. And, you know, the Episcopal Church is known for being uh, fairly liberal. But we managed to say together as a denomination through the Civil War by being polite and compromising our values. You know, the, the church was not true to its call to be agents of justice and reconciliation. And I'll also tell you this. See, <laughs> the person who actually helped to uphold uh, slavery in the Episcopal Church was John Hopkins, the first bishop of the Episcopal Church. Sit with that for a second, because... <laughs> God is good because I didn't know that before I got here. I researched everything I could on Vermont, on being here. I uh, heard about other people's experiences of being black and speaking out. And I thought, OK, yeah, I can come here. And I'm sitting in my dining, in my living room. And my communications person said, oh, yes, well, you know John Hopkins, blah, 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 blah. And I said, wait, 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 back up. What do you mean the first bishop of the Episcopal Church upheld slavery and then I mean because he wasn't just bishop here he was in charge of the whole Episcopal Church when he did that and I thought wow hmm I didn't know how much I would be dealing with race when I got here it was important to the all the, the white people that voted for me because that's really who voted who brought me here I didn't know that but apparently this was something we needed to continue to resolve you know, generations later, we made and renewed commitments as a church to dismantle racism, yet it still haunts us because we are infected with politeness and false equivalencies. We're trying to own this and change our ways, though. And as a great elder, Maya Angelou, once said, when you know better, do better. So we try. So black people, be whole people with full emotions. Sometimes you just need to cry and be angry and feel discouraged. And as we think about how we keep going and get through these things, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. told people engaged in the move movement with him that they needed a rule of life 
to strengthen them and sustain them through this work. And Keaton told the people to meditate on the words of Jesus. Well, this works for me. I don't care what you read. Read whatever holy book you like. Read it. Find some books. Find something that helps you to stay grounded in peace and in words of, in, in, of integrity. And stay informed. Stay informed by reading other works that analyze and stir your thoughts and move you to action. This is hard work. Life's work. This is not a race. This is not a marathon. It, it's more like a marathon or a relay. So stay connected. Sometimes you're going to have to tag somebody else in. And don't worry about being tired. Every once in a while you have to keep going. But tag somebody else in. And have each other's back. Support one another. Care for your body and your soul. Now being the last person to address our Juneteenth assembly, it was my role to wrap everything up nicely with something positive. <laughs> well, on the surface, most of what I said, you know, might not seem completely uplifting. But we owe it to ourselves to speak the truth. To speak our truths. Yeah. My beloved black siblings, it is for such a time as this that our unique God-given gifts are to be used for the true emancipation of this nation. And on our quest for freedom, this is a truth of which I am certain. We are the definition of resilience and creativity. I am certain of the truth that as black citizens, we have the gift and responsibility of being the storytellers of this nation and this state's complicated history. Our presence and our black lives are a testament to our insistence on hope, and we carry the vision for what this country is intended to be. And so I'd like to close with, and I just am amazed that this is a prayer that is in a prayer book for Episcopalians. And this is what also gives me hope, that we could envision and pray prayers about a life and a world that we don't even know about yet. So let me pray this prayer for you and with you. Almighty God, giver of all good things, we thank you for the natural majesty and beauty of this land. They restore us, though we often destroy them. Heal us. We thank you for the great resources of this nation. They make us rich, though we often exploit them. Forgive us. We thank you for our siblings who have made this country strong. They are models for us, though we often fall short of them. Inspire us. We thank you for the torch of liberty which has been lit in this land. It has drawn people from every nation, though we have often hidden from its light. Enlighten us. We thank you for the faith we have inherited in all its rich variety. It sustains our life. Though we have been faithless again and again, we knew us. Help us, O Divine One, to finish the good work here begun. Strengthen our efforts to blot out ignorance and prejudice and to abolish disparities and iniquities and hasten the day when all our people, with many voices and one united chorus, will glorify your goodness. Amen. Thank you so much, Right Reverend Doctor. So as we close out today, once again, happy Juneteenth. Black Lives Matter, repeat after me. Black Lives Matter. 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 Now I hope that you will join us as we walk down Church Street in solidarity. Thank you.